Hello. Hello, IWM International Women's Ministries. Come on in here. Let me make sure that we are live on the right page. Let me know as you're gathering. I would love to say hello to you in the name of the Lord. Hello, hello. Come on in here. I'm Ashley Nelson, and I can see right there. There we go. Hopefully, you can hear me well. We'll wait just a moment and see that everything is in order. As we are getting ready to do a short teaching today on when God is silent. And I know already you are thinking God is not silent. And that is correct. But we're going to get into a discussion on it today. And I can see that I'm a little lopsided. We may not be able to handle that. So, anyways, welcome, welcome. I am Ashley with International Women's Ministries, and I am so excited to be with you today. I actually need that phone, so I don't want to put it down. And we're going to get into a teaching today, and I'm excited that you can join me. And I want to talk to you about the question, what do I do when my emotion, what do I do with my emotions when God is silent? What do I do with my feelings when I feel like I'm praying about something or being persistent in prayer about something and God does not answer me or God does not answer me when I want him to or God does not uh, respond back to me? And what do I do basically when I am perceiving that God is being silent on an issue? And so I want to talk to you about that today. And this kind of irritated me because I can see that my screen is going like this, but I can't help it because I need that light. So we're going to deal with it. So come on in. Share this with your friends if you would. If you're catching the replay, you're also welcome uh, to share this with your friends at that time. We would love just to get people connected to this Facebook page at International Women's Ministries. We would just love for people to know what missionaries we're praying for, what's on our heart and projects, how to support. There's a lot of different reasons to connect people to here. Also for the ministry of this page in prayer, the ministry of this page in teaching and in exhortation. So connect your people here and let's worship the Lord together. Let's minister to each other, but also let's follow the leading of the Lord together. So I'm going to go ahead and share this to my page, and then we're going to get started. We're not going to wait long on people to gather today because it's the work week, right? Probably some people are still at work, and that's okay. I just got to fork myself, and so everybody's ready to start the weekend. Let's start the weekend, but let's do so in an attitude of worship and in a welcoming spirit for the Lord and the Holy Spirit's teaching on this Friday. So let's pray. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for the next couple of minutes. Then when I, get, I want to get into today's topic. I really want for us to ask ourselves this question about persistent prayer and our emotional response to when God is silent. Silent on our prayers or doesn't answer them in the time or in the way that we think that He should. So let's pray. God. We come to you, Father, we come to you. You're the Lord of our lives, and we give you thanks that your word is clear. We give you thanks that your Holy Spirit is the spirit of all knowledge and all wisdom. We ask that you would make this conversation plain to us today. Exhort us, Holy Spirit. Teach us. Grant us wisdom according to your word, and help us, Father, to change our minds and our hearts concerning this topic should we need to repent, should we need to react in any way, Lord, we want to be active worshipers of you. We want to be doers of your word. So speak to us today, we pray. Let your word do what it's intended to do, which is change us. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So have you ever, have you ever had this situation personally if you, as you're building history with God and your relationship with God? Have you ever felt like the heavens were brass in response to your praise, in response to your worship, in response to your persistent prayers? Have you ever said, uh, why is God not answering me? Why is he silent on this issue? Why has he not responded to the promise that he gave me? Why has my answer not manifested? Why have my family not come back to the Lord? Why have my marriage not been restored? Why am I still sick? Whatever. Why has the money not come through or the promotion come through or, or whatever it is that you've been contending for? 
have you ever gotten to the place of frustration maybe or of questioning maybe and said what is going on God uh, or in a different reaction felt your emotions begin to respond to maybe the lack of what you perceived the lack of response of your Heavenly Father to be in a situation that's what led to this provocation of the Holy Spirit to go into this discussion with you today and I want to have a frank discussion with you but I want you to leave exhorted I want you to leave equipped and lifted up and it's my heart that we would really really ask the Lord what do we do what are we supposed to do and so I want to just take a minute and tell you if this has been something that you've gone through or that you're going through you're in good company it was Jesus himself who said in Matthew 27 when he was on the cross uh, my God why have you forsaken me Jesus said that after he had been in the garden before going to the cross and said you know um, Lord Father maybe this cup of going to the cross and being nailed and given as the living sacrifice for all mankind maybe this cup could just pass from me if it's your will and then on the cross uh, when he was fulfilling his father's will and taking on the sin of the world he said why have you forsaken me and of course um, this was a feeling an emotional response to the rejection that heaven had that heaven has to sin and so um, this blood covered sin but in that moment Jesus felt what we sometimes feel where are you God why did why do I have to go through this and um, maybe you have felt that maybe you felt forsaken maybe you felt unvindicated maybe you have a long history with God and you say you know why do I have to go through these things I've been so faithful to you and that's how Hezekiah felt King Hezekiah felt that way in the book of Isaiah and the prophet Isaiah had to go to Hezekiah and say hey you need to get your stuff in order because your life is going to be cut short and you need to leave everything in order and Hezekiah had this uh, this unvindicated feeling like like why God and he began to call out to the Lord and and say but I have history with you I've served you faithfully since I was very young and tried to uphold your mandates and and then Hezekiah was granted 15 more years of life and maybe you felt lonely because you've been praying to God and you don't feel his imminent presence in your life you know that the Bible says he never leaves us he never forsakes us but you don't feel God you don't feel his presence his imminent presence with you David felt that and he said where are you where are you maybe you felt punished maybe you felt like God is punishing you like Job who said what in the world but even so I'm going to serve the Lord maybe you felt persecuted like Paul who felt persecuted but said counted as joy who had to go to prison who had uh, like many apostles lose their life but in the midst of that persecution he cried out and worship he cried out for the lost and he fulfilled his mandate in the earth but he still felt persecuted he, he still knew that part of bearing his cross in the natural earth was that persecution maybe you felt ridiculed by the impatience and the accusations of, of man Noah felt that of course he was told to do something quite drastic and uh, he was ridiculed for it by people that were supposed to be his friends and and they didn't have patience for what they were doing and he was left um, by a lot of them but still he had to be obedient maybe you felt abandoned like Joseph who was sold into slavery by his brothers and had to go through in his natural life before promotion had to go through many rings of obedience from the from the pit to the prison to the palace they say or maybe you felt doubt like maybe God's word really isn't true maybe I'm really not in God's will there are many responses that we have in contending seasons in seasons where we don't see God's immediate answer or we don't feel God's imminent presence or in trials or in tribulations and so 
I'm going to give you some exhortation today, and then I want to get into the Word. And, and what I want to exhort you with is I want to tell you that your lamentations in those seasons belong to God. Lamentations, the lament of a woeing heart, of a heavy heart, of a questioning heart, of a doubtful heart, of a lonely heart. Those lamentations belong to the Lord. And you don't have to fake it. You don't have to fake or run or hide or quit in those seasons where you're wondering, what do I do with all these emotions, the forsaken emotions, the unvindicated, the lonely, the punished, the persecuted, the ridiculed, the abandoned, or doubt? You don't have to hide those things. There was a reason that Jesus rebuked the disciples and the religious and said, let them come as children. Let the children come. Because why? They're pure in heart. They're not hiding their emotions. They're not acting a certain way in the middle of difficult realities. They're not pretending or pretentious. And it was Jesus who said, come as the little children. And I think we have to remind ourselves that um, we, don't, we have to come naked and vulnerable into the presence of the Lord and understand that our lamentations and seasons where we don't see uh, God manifesting the answer right away, or fulfilling the promise right away that those limitations of the endurance belong to him and we can come into his presence if we don't quit and we can say this is hard and I don't like it and and begin to unfold what those feelings and emotions are it's when those limitations and those woes turn into sin that we have a problem you know uh, pain doesn't separate you from God it doesn't. Illness doesn't separate you from God. Unfulfilled prayers or unanswered prayers don't separate you from God. It's bitterness. It's disobedience. It's quitting. It's turning your back. It's walking away. It's a, a critical spirit. Those things, those things begin to cloud the spiritual eyes and the mind and the ears and causes separation and a misunderstanding of the voice of the Father in your life. And so at that point, they've got to be dealt with through repentance. But when we begin to see these seasons of, what do I do with my emotions when God is silent as invitations? See, the, this is the instruction I want to give to you today through the Word of God. We've got to begin to see these seasons of long waiting and these seasons of endurance as invitations. What are we being invited to by these seasons? Because we all have them. If you're new in a relationship with God, um, maybe you haven't experienced this yet, but if you build history with God, you know that there are seasons of endurance and testing. There are seasons where God is not, um, is, is not just responding quickly to your contending or speaking clearly on an issue right away. And that's why there's a lot of instruction in the Word of God about how to navigate these seasons. And I want to get into some of these invitations that we have, some of these invitations that we have uh, when these seasons arise. Our limitations belong to Him, but they're also an invitation. What, what are these invitations? I want to get with you first in Psalm 13 and if you're there I want you to tell you I want you to read the whole Psalm Psalm 13 is short it's not very long but I want to tell you it's only six verses but it's kind of laid out into okay um, this is the problem this is the prayer and then this is the rejoicing and so in the beginning this is David, and there's really no specific event that we can track this psalm to in David's life. We know a lot about David's life. We know more about David's life than we know about a lot of people in the Bible. But we don't know specifically what this event is a response to, but David made his worship and his prayer relationship with the Lord very open in his letters and in his songs. And so we have great insight into what his relationship with the Lord was and and we know he endured a lot and that he tried to remain faithful and be after God's heart. But he said in the beginning of the chapter, How long, Lord, will you forget me? Forever? How long? 
How long? How many times have we thought that? How long is this going to take, God? Because really, this is not a new situation. I've done brought this to you forever. Are you just going to ignore it? See, that's, those are the lamentations that belong to the Lord. See, David brought that right to God. He wasn't talk, chattering to everybody else, spreading lack of, uh, lack of faith or spreading fear or spreading criticism or complaining. He brought it to the Lord. Those lamentations have to belong to God. He can handle it, I promise. David's not rejecting the Lord. He's asking a question. How long? How long will you hide your face from me? Why can't I feel you, God? Why can't I see you in this situation? Where are you now? Like literally, where's the slingshot? Where's the stones? How am I going to slay this giant? Where are you? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? That's a great question from Psalm 13. And that's the heart of the instruction today. What do I do with these emotions? Because my emotions will lie to me. My emotions will lie to me. My emotions should not govern my spiritual life because they're little liars that tell me God can't hear me. God doesn't care about that. These are emotions. Emotions that are surrendered to God will be filtered through the truth of the Word of God. But emotions that are surrendered to the flesh will be contrary to what the Word of God says. How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? And then he begins to seek the Lord's answer on it. He shifts from, this is my, these are the questions and my laments and my emotions. And then he shifts and he says, God, look on me and answer me. Answer me. Give light to my eyes. Show me. Or I will sleep in death and my enemy will say, I've overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. And then here is the position at the end. He says, but I trust. All this, these are my questions, these are my laments, these are my emotions. Here's my prayer, but also here's my position. I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. And this is what I want for us to understand when it comes to these seasons. There's an invitation here to reiterate our position. I can bring my lamentations and just surrender them to God. These are the woes that I feel. This is what I'm struggling with. He was struggling with where are you, God, and why can't I see you in this situation? And you may have a different one. We've already listed some at the top of this instruction. Maybe you feel forsaken. Maybe you feel unvindicated. Maybe you feel lonely. Maybe you feel punished or persecuted or ridiculed or abandoned. Or maybe you're in doubt because you thought you had a promise from the Lord. It hasn't manifested yet. All of those things God can handle if we're honest about them. It's when we try to act like that that's not what's going on, that we get pretentious and false in our position waivers. David says, this is my real position. I trust in your unfailing love. My heart will still rejoice in salvation. Do you know that no matter what you go through with the Lord, your position in salvation is still a miracle and still something to rejoice about? I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. These are the invitations to reiterate my position. I'm still going to trust. I'm still going to be joyful. I'm still going to sing your praise. And those are the things that we try to complicate. We try to be like so complicated about stuff. It's not that complicated. Sometimes you're going to have to wait. We've got to begin to see these things as an invitation. The invitation in Psalm 13 is to reiterate my position. It doesn't matter, God, if you answer one more prayer in my life. You've done enough. I'm saved. I have joy in that. You've already been good to me. So therefore, my position is not going to change. I'm still going to trust you, and I'm still going to sing your praise. Period. I've got these questions. Hey, but they are not changing my position. And I bet that many of you, have said things like this to the Lord before. I remember when I was sick, I had a death sentence on my life, aplastic anemia. They said, you will die from this. There is no cure. And for 485 days, I prayed the same prayer. 
God, I know you can heal me, but even if you don't, even if you don't, I know you can. I don't see you in this yet. I don't know what this is for, but even if you don't, I am still going to serve you. Understand that you have these invitations and reiterate your position to the Lord. I still trust you. I still trust you. I will still sing your praise. I will still join my salvation because you have been good to me. Another invitation that you have in response to these seasons is actively waiting. What does Isaiah 40, 31 say? But they that wait, they that trust, they that hope, they that wait upon the Lord will what? Renew their strength. Sometimes God is not answering you right away because you don't have the strength to endure the answer. Your strength needs to be refreshed. Your strength needs to be renewed. You need to be promoted to a faith place to carry what your answer entails. And so God's timing is more perfect than yours. And you need to get in there and wait for a minute. Wait a minute. Actively waiting. That's what he was doing here again in Psalm 13. I don't see it. I don't hear it. My enemies are closing in on me. I think I'm probably going to die. I don't know what's going on. However, my position has not changed. I still serve you. And sometimes we have to understand the invitation to actively wait on the Lord, which is what Isaiah 40, 31 means. They that wait, they that trust, they that hope. Is your trust fortified? Is your hope enduring? Those are the statements of the righteous given to us in the Word of God. And we've got to understand, and we have to be reminded at times, this is not um, a condemnation. This is an invitation. I'm invited to be fortified in my trust and reiterate, is my faith strong enough to endure the answer? Is my trust fortified to the place where I would trust Him anyway? Is my hope enduring enough for the next season and all that that answer would bring into my life? Because God is the one who knows that. God is the one that knows that. You know, you may be also receiving an invitation to go back and obey what God has already told you to do. Sometimes God is not manifesting the answer because we haven't obeyed what we already know. Even when God isn't speaking to us directly the way that we understand it in our spiritual eyes and ears, His Word is always there. It's alive and active. He's not sleeping. He's not asleep on you. He's not in slumber. He hasn't left your situation. He's mindful of you. He knows all things outside of your time paradigm. He's already given you instructions to obey. And sometimes he's not showing up or manifesting in the way that make your feelings and emotions settle down because it's an invitation to go back and obey. Psalm 84, 11 says this, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. He's shining on you and protecting you. The Lord will give grace and glory, and no good thing will He withhold from them that what? From them that walk uprightly. From those who are counted righteous, righteous, righteous in His sight. He's not withholding it. But sometimes we've got to go back and obey, and we've got to do a fruit examination on our life and say, Are we walking uprightly? What's the last thing he told me to do? Did I get outside of his will there? What's the last thing he told me to do? What's, in his, what's the instruction in his word? Am I obeying there? Am I treating others in relationships the way I'm supposed to do? Am I walking in unforgiveness? Am I walking in self-righteousness? Or am I walking uprightly? He's not going to withhold any good thing from those that are walking uprightly. Well, does that imply that he is going to withhold some things from those who are outside of righteousness? Absolutely. You can't walk in the favor of the Lord and be disobedient. It's outside of his character. 
He's going to withhold some things from people who are not righteous. Heaven is one of them. Heaven is one of them. We have to understand. Do we need to go back? Hold on. This is an invitation for a fruit inspection by me. Holy Ghost, is there anything in me? David said it's hurt me. Maybe this is a me problem. <laughs> yes, let's get back to surrender. Let's get back to repentance. Repentance is still right. Okay? Holiness is still right. Righteousness is still right. Let's look at the invitation in the written word of God that we have to obedience and faithfulness. Before we get critical, before we get lonely, before we get bitter, before we get whatever, downtrodden. Let's look at these things. And the last scripture that I really want to share with you, and you'll already know if you know me, is James chapter 1. And I want to tell you to read the whole chapter in this context. Maybe you've not read it with these questions on your heart before or asking the Holy Spirit in this type of a season before. What does James chapter 1 have to say about this? But James, all five chapters are instructions for how to live a righteous life. But James himself speaks so much, so much about this particular topic. And so we're talking about the invitations that these seasons bring to us. And and so another one that I want to talk about is building our faith. Because one of the things that our emotions will draw us to is lack of faith or doubt. And doubt is wrapped up in self-righteousness. Because it means that we're trusting that we can control the outcome. There's no doubt wrapped up in fully trusting God. That's hope. <laughs> and that's faith. But when doubt enters in, it means that we're aligned with our flesh and with our feelings and our emotions. And so we've got to begin to see this as an invitation to build my faith. Build my faith. And so what did James say about this? This very familiar passage of Scripture in chapter 1. And I'm going to read you a few verses starting in verse 2. I'm not going to read you the whole chapter, but I encourage you to. And in verse 2 it says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. And we laugh about this every time we read it because it sounds ridiculous. Really? I'm not considering it pure joy, James. I'm not doing that. It's stupid. <laughs> no offense, but no. But why? But why? We forget the why. Why should we do that? Let me start again. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. We have to begin to understand that perseverance is what it takes to be an overcomer. We're positioned in this life with victory to be more than overcomers, but you will not be more than an overcomer with no perseverance. You will not be more than an overcomer without perseverance. How do you develop perseverance? But through testing and trials. Because if I made it through this and it was hard, I can do the next hard thing because of what David said. I'm still going to praise him because he has been good to me. Some of you need some has-beens. Persevere to the point where you can say, he has been good to me. Build a history with God. Persevere to the point where you can say, oh, he has been. I have many testimonies to count. I have many victories to count. I have many Many to articulate, to say, oh, he brought me through that. Oh, he brought me through that. Oh, he brought me. Th oh, I persevered through that. Oh, I didn't quit. Oh, I endured. Build some has-beens. David had a has-been relationship with God. He has been good to me. And therefore, he walked into his future. He gave his lamentations to the Lord. He didn't hold him back. He just gave, surrendered him right to him. But he said, my position is solid. Produce perseverance. Be invited to build your faith. Give doubt a kick by having a with itness. I'm about to stick with it. I'm sticking with it. And then, what am I going to do with my perseverance? This is verse 4. I love it. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. What about if I'm mature and complete and I'm not lacking anything? What would I be lacking? Faith. 
faith, faith, and also wisdom. Wisdom is the ability, the spiritual ability to apply the Word of God in your life. And we already know that the Word of God has everything that we need, every instruction in it that we need in this life can be found in the written Word of God. But if we persevere and we get mature and we become complete, we're not going to be lacking anything. We're going to have perseverance and maturity. And the other thing that we would need is wisdom. And James said, if you lack wisdom, ask God. He's going to give it generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask what? You must not doubt. You must not doubt. Be invited to the place where you must not doubt. And persevere until you don't. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Many of us are not receiving from the Lord in the time because we still are a close companion with doubt. We lack faith. The Bible said that, not me. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. That's verses 2 through 8. Read it a couple times and see what the Lord might say to you. Uh, and then the last things that I want us to be invited to by these seasons is to trust His timing. I'm not going to go into timing a lot because we already know that God's timing is perfect and He says that everything will be manifest in its due season or at its right time. We can't control that. And to me, that is um, not a mature understanding. That's a basic understanding of our relationship with God. You've got to surrender your timing and things uh, to be at peace in your relationship with God. And so navigate situations until you can give up that control by faith. Trust His timing on things. And then still in James chapter 1 and down in verse 27, I want to ask you to go back. We're going to take this full circle back into what we said in the beginning about Jesus. You know, it was Jesus who said um, in the garden, Lord, would you let this cup pass for me? And He was talking about before he was going to go to the cross and he was still communing with the father following his will understanding God's will for him in the earth he knew what he was there to do he had already walked um, the earth as a righteous man for over 30 years he knew what his future was but he was flesh and there was pain that was in his future and there was darkness and punishment and accusation and rejection and there was betrayal and he said God just to make sure is this the only way <laughs> and then he said but uh, if it is if this is the way that you choose I want your will I want your will and I want to remind us today that that needs to be a paramount concern of ours as righteous believers in Jesus Christ. We have to want God's will more than anything. Because remember, it is God's will that none should perish. And everything that we do in this life wraps up into that purpose that the lost find Jesus. That we love and that we love well and that we are loved well. And if that's not a paramount fixation of our eyes, our focus in seeking the kingdom first and in looking at Jesus, then we're going to miss some things. And so sometimes we need this invitation to realign our will. And that's what Jesus was doing in the garden. He was bringing his lamentation, but he was also taking the opportunity to again articulate his position. My position hasn't changed. I still want your will. I'm still going to follow you. I'm still going to do what you've asked me to do. But just in case, if there's another way. Sometimes we've got to take this, these invitations and realign our will and say, God, I don't want to wait anymore. <laughs> I don't want to wait anymore. I don't want to pray about this anymore. I don't want to be hurt anymore. I don't want to be grieved anymore. I don't want to do any of this. But if this is the way to stay in your will, I'm still going to do it. And that's what Jesus said. And sometimes we need to take opportunities to realign our will with the Lord. And so in, verse, in James 1, verse 27, it says, Religion that our God the Father accepts 
as pure and faultless as this. To look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And so sometimes I want to ask these questions. God, am I still pursuing purity? Am I still pursuing holiness? Because that's the kind of religion that you accept, pure and faultless. And am I still mindful of my brother and my sister and the orphans and the widows? Do I still love my neighbor well? Because I don't want to be outside of your will there. Do I still actively guard my gates to keep myself from being polluted by the world? We have to sometimes take these seasons where we want God to do so much. Do this, God. Do this, God. And do this. And why haven't you done this? And why haven't you done this? To understand that it's our invitation to be the doer. Take it back to the Word. You can't earn God's answer in prayer. But you can align with His instructions and release His hand to move in your life in His perfect timing by activating your faith. Activating your faith. Building perseverance. Asking for wisdom. And fortifying your position. I double down. I'm going to tell you. I double down. In my situations where I have to contend, I double down. I push in prayer. I pursue with more fervor. I begin to declare my history, my has-beens, but God has already done this, and He's already done this, and we have to make it a spiritual discipline to contend passionately and fervently. And when we're just supposed to stand and wait, we have to do it with the full faith and knowing that Isaiah 40, 31 is true. When I wait on God, when I wait on God, when I wait on God, He's renewing my strengths because everything that's coming to me in the next season, I must have a strength of endurance to carry His will with wisdom, with maturity, with perseverance. And that's my exhortation to you today. I know you're waiting. I know you're contending. I know you're tired. I know that there are many of us who have been praying about something for a very long season and we're tempted to run or to be grumpy. Or, and, and there are practical things that we can do. You need to call somebody and say, I'm tired. Pray with me. Use wisdom in that. You need to understand that you're not alone. But you need to also understand the invitations that we've discussed today. And that's what I really want to pray comes, comes to you through this instruction from the Holy Spirit. And I pray that we begin to contend like we never have before with a greater endurance, with a greater perseverance, with a greater strength and fortitude, and with a greater faith. Because we have history with God. We have maturity. We have maturity. And we have wisdom. That's my prayer for you today. So know that you are loved. Thank you for joining. I want you to share this if you would. Just so that people know that International Women's Ministries is here. It's a great blessing to us. And so I want to thank Autumn as always for allowing me to come on and teach. And I hope that you guys have a great, great weekend. And a great Friday afternoon.